Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure to be presenting today at the Artificial Intelligence for Information Accessibility 2022 conference. Uh, my name is Andrew Knight, I'm the Global Lead for Data and Technology uh, within the Thought Leadership Directorate to, to RICS, the uh, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, and my role is to look at the impact of data and technology right across the built and natural environment. So what is the state of uh, AI across the built and natural environment? Well, it's clearly having already a profound impact on the assets where we all work, live, play, learn, travel, uh, have our health care and our, our senior living. So it's clearly a critical sector, not only for the human experience, but from an ESG and sustainability perspective. And it's probably correct to say that uh, despite many advances, that the sector as a whole is very much in the early stages of digitization, let alone looking at the application of AI and machine learning. Having said that, uh, increasingly large amounts of data is being captured and used to train and operate AI and machine learning across a wide variety of use cases. So just some examples are really just looking at the fundamentals of land and property ownership, title deeds and national land registries and cadastral systems using AI to interpret documents. The fundamental issues of digital identity, which obviously cover uh, other areas and other use cases across other sectors. But when we think around property transactions, using AI to interpret images and documents and to then store and share verified, verified ID is becoming increasingly a, a, a use case that's very important to establish the identity of people within property transactions. We then have valuation, which is increasingly automated using AI models, particularly in the residential sector and more of that to come. And then we look at building occupancy, monitoring people, monitoring activity of people in buildings through assets such as railway stations and other mass transit. We then have that arguably quite generic aspect of facial recognition systems, which are increasingly used in public and private spaces and indeed hybrid spaces that I'll talk about later. And another example where people are using effectively profiling techniques to try and predict the likelihood of missed payments, people having challenges around payments for rental properties and those kind of things. So just a, a flavour there of some of the, uh, the areas where people are already applying AI across what is a very broad sector. And in fact, uh, in that context, it's worth perhaps reflecting just on the, the sheer scope of the property and land life cycle. It really does touch every aspect of cradle to grave as we use land and build property on it. And you start fundamentally with that land title, that land ownership, whether that's for compensation, simply establishing rights uh, over a particular property and, and a particular structure. And then you get into that area of planning and zoning, zoning and using sort of um, land tech to establish the kind of areas where development should be used and where data can be built to establish uh, the best places from kind of an appraisal perspective to develop assets. And then you're looking at the financing side, building models with large data sets to look at locational characteristics to understand where finance and development is best placed. And then in the construction sector itself, the larger the asset, the more likely you are going to have really quite complex scheduling challenges around how to build assets in the most economic way possible. And indeed, running through this whole thread is this ESG, this understanding of how to build materials, how to assemble the right kind of materials to, to maximise not only the embedded carbon, but the operational carbon as well. You run through valuation. Once again, a lot of automation taking place there. Similarly, around brokerage, assembling data sets uh, and machine learning to look at characteristics there from the investment perspective. And then once you get into that operational and property management phase, increasingly as we either build smart buildings with sensors, the Internet of Things or retrofit that kind of technology onto existing assets, we're being presented with very large data sets that only really AI can actually interpret and get that signal to noise ratio into an appropriate level where we can actually make sensible decisions on how to run these assets. And if you think once again of the ESG dimension and think about the importance of material banks, um, recycling materials at the end of life, it's really important that we have this information, these large data sets to be stored and analysed so we can understand what we do with assets when they do come to the end of life. 
So where is the sector on its journey? Well, as I, as I mentioned, in many respects, the, the sector is very fragmented and therefore a lot of actors haven't really uh, even started on their road digitization. So depending on where they are on their journey, they may, may now well be looking at AI and using it either internally or from outside vendors. But I think it's fair to say that generally there's probably still only a basic understanding and focus on the issues of, of data and AI and the ethical considerations. And whilst in many jurisdictions, clearly the, the Brussels effect means that many jurisdictions have a GDPR type regulatory environment around data protection, I think many firms see that as a tick in the box, that once they've achieved that kind of regulatory uh, compliance, that they've effectively addressed some of these issues, which clearly is not the case. And I think there's still a, a lot of thought that needs to be put into how to deal with these considerations of designing, developing, training, governing, operating these AI models. And clearly many potential issues that have already come out of the uh, uh, the experience of, of, of participants in this sector, many of which are just simply around uh, the inadequate performance of these models, that simply they don't have either sufficiently uh, selected data sets, data sets that are representative, algorithms that are fit for purpose. So in many cases, just from a, a performance perspective, many of these models are not necessarily delivering uh, the benefits and, the, and the, the, the intended design criteria that were, were, were set out in the first place. There are clearly elements of, of bias that can creep in at, at every stage, as you all know. And I think there's a, clearly a concern here, given the wide impact on individuals across the built environment there, uh, really are quite big issues about agency in terms of people actually having control, uh, that whether these models are being used to make decisions about them, whether it's lending, um, whether it's around their occupancy, whether it's about their ability to pay, for example, uh, and also this this concern I think more broadly about digital exclusion, where clearly people who don't perhaps have a digital footprint or, or indeed aren't able to access the, the decisions that have been made to understand and join into this kind of digital world will be necessarily excluded from positive effects that these models might have or be able to challenge and understand how to interact with them. And I think there's a big educational piece more broadly society wise to make sure that people understand that AI is being implemented and for them to understand how they can challenge, get involved and understand how this technology has been used in decisions that have very profound effects upon them. A couple of early challenges to, to talk about briefly. Uh, I've touched on this automated valuation area. Many of you will have heard of the phrase AVM or automated valuation model. Uh, and in many advanced economies, that kind of technology, that kind of model is being used uh, on upwards of 50% of lending decisions by large uh, secured lending banks looking at the mortgage business where, as I say, Half of those decisions, whether for originating or remortgaging, can be based upon these automated valuation models. They're clearly being used in the kind of brokerage world to give consumers an estimate of value when they think about selling or looking at buying a house. And I think we have to be very, very careful here in the sense that these AVMs, although very prevalent, uh, only ever see a percentage of the data that reflects the value of a property. They can only see so much. They may have limitations clearly if there's been no physical inspection. They may be using other sources of information around condition, uh, such as external photographs perhaps. But once again, they may not have the full data set to be totally uh, effective. And as well as this kind of residential lending and brokerage, we should also be thinking about taxation. Quite often, uh, models now are being used for typical government property taxation. And once again, not all the data may be available there. We have to think about explainability, the ability of people to challenge decisions when it comes to not only domestic property taxes, but also business as well. And then perhaps finally, a, a broad generic application of AI around facial recognition. These systems are being rolled out quite commonly around private, public and hybrid settings such as railway stations, mass transit. And once again, I think there's still a large gap in understanding of the ethical issues, the governance issues of how these systems are used, how images might be shared with law enforcement and other stakeholders and agencies. So a big challenge to understand issues of consent and how that data is used. So some really significant opportunities and challenges for the built environment, given the huge effect we have on people's lives. So once again, a real pleasure to chat today. And if any of you want to get in touch and talk more about the implications within the built environment, uh, I'm Andrew Knight. My email address is anight at uh, rics.org.